Oh my gosh, everyone, it's time to review the MacBook Pro 16 inch. It's so impressive. It has so many ports um, and the keyboard. The keyboard is just phenomenal. <laughs> Rest in peace, MagSafe charger. Rest in peace. <laughs> Shout out to Trade Coffee for sponsoring this video. I love coffee so much and Trade connects you to the top roasters all across the country and according to your taste. First taste test. Oh yeah. Okay, so the MacBook Pro 16, the display got a little bigger, the bezel shrunk down, uh, and the size just got a little bit Thicker. So from the eye, it hasn't changed a ton in comparison to the 15 inch MacBook Pros. However, we have the new Magic Keyboard, which is pretty reminiscent to the old MacBook that I just shown. So thank goodness they got rid of that butterfly keyboard. It was the worst. When it came to quality control, what Apple should be known for, they just failed miserably with that. So they've actually addressed all of these blatant issues. So now it's just about how does it perform? Can I actually recommend this to people again? So we're gonna hop into a few creative workflows. How is it for video editing, photo editing, and also you programmers. I don't wanna forget about you guys. Okay, video editing. Uh, the touch bar is still useless. I know a few people like scroll, you know, through a Final Cut Pro timeline using the touch bar, but guys, when it comes to volume, just turn up the volume. That's something we need a physical key for, okay? We can't have such an important part of our process rely on that sketchy screen that sometimes freezes. This is me trying to turn it down. So what do you do when that happens? I just restart the computer. I can't stress enough how much better the new keyboard is, and also the speakers are pretty amazing. I compared it to the Yoga C940, which is a two-in-one that I've really enjoyed and was so impressed by those speakers, so here they are side by side. <laughs> Okay, time to talk a little bit of specs and the ergonomics. Okay, time to talk a little bit of specs and the ergonomics. The LCD, you guys know that I hate dongle life. I mean, truly, I love me a good USB-A port. Dare I say an SD card slot in my laptop. The SD card is not going anywhere and I don't think it would hurt them to add one, but we now know that that will never happen. And I love how Apple is like, hey, you're never even gonna have to plug in a hard drive anymore because we're now offering eight terabytes of SSD storage built within. Of course, it's so insanely expensive. Apple, they're, they're pricey with their SSDs. The speeds you get from average hard drives is just so different than actually being on the internal SSD. Um, so I think that's going to be super helpful for video pros. Having those four USB-C Thunderbolt 3 ports, yes, allows for maximum IO, plugging things in, daisy chaining things, um, but that means so much of your workflow relies on a tiny cheap dongle. And I can't tell you how many times a hard drive has just randomly disconnect, even when it's not relying on a dongle, when it's plugged in straight via USB-C. I don't know if that is commentary on USB-C as a whole, the fact that it's kind of a loose connection, um, or if it's just a MacBook problem, because it seems to be happening mostly on MacBooks. I had that issue all the time with my 2016. So when it comes to proper video editing, I mainly use Premiere and sometimes Resolve. MacBooks have never had an issue in terms of like sluggish timelines, they've always been pretty snappy. Previously, we've seen it kind of struggle with render times in comparisons to Windows laptops. CUDA rendering, cooling, among other things attributed to that, as well as optimization from the Premiere side. You can watch a previous video I made of Adobe Premiere really stepping it up when it comes to MacBook and Premiere workflow with utilizing Intel QuickSync and also Metal rendering. I'll link that here, I won't get into the nitty gritty of that per se, um, but all I have to say is whatever they did with this increase of airflow, I am shooketh by the performance that I'm seeing in Premiere. Are you guys ready for this? Like I'm 
speechless. Because there's already comparisons on the internet of the MacBook i7 versus the i9 and i7 MacBook versus Windows i7, um, I wanted to compare based on price. So you guys know I love my Asus ZenBook Pro Duo. It's a thick boy, but I love that second screen. It's a really cool laptop. The equivalent MacBook price with the i9 would be $3,500, so $500 more expensive. And the MacBook that I've been testing, which is John's, has the i7, 32 gigabytes of RAM, the highest graphics option and with the one terabyte SSD so very similar to the Zenbook it comes in at $31.99 so it's still $200 more expensive than the Zenbook but we're getting much closer in price so if you're debating that big laptop purchase you have 3k to spend where should you spend it so when I did these render tests it was the same exact project it was when I interviewed Matt Diavilla for my podcast that creative life I have a video portion of it it is an hour and 10 minutes I think when you test these longer exports, you really see the differences. As you can hear, oh my gosh, that MacBook fan is kicking on. And it's almost, it's great to hear that, right? I wanna hear that airflow going. I mean, this is a new chassis. It doesn't look that different, but they have added components to increase that airflow. So I love, I you love to see it. Let's talk Resolve and Premiere. It's just shocking to me. The ZenBook is so thick. There's a ton of places where the air can go and it has the i9, right? It has the i9 and the RTX 2060. Okay, I'm just gonna tell you the results because in Resolve, the ZenBook exported that hour long podcast in 24 minutes and 21 seconds, which is impressive, right? That's a good time. The MacBook did it in 12 minutes and 53 seconds. Okay, and then I opened up the same exact project in Premiere. The ZenBook did it in 23 minutes in Premiere, and the MacBook did it in 13 minutes and 23 seconds. So, so the MacBook is literally doing render times double the speed of the ZenBook that I love so much. That hurts me a little bit, but I'm glad to see it. MacBook, I think you're good again. Those are words coming out of my mouth. Is the MacBook good again? You're gonna have to deal with that dumb touch bar and the dumb dongle life, but I can now confidently recommend this to people if they are in favor, of course, of the Mac OS operating system. It performs so well. Are you guys shocked by those numbers? It's pretty crazy, right? So, okay, so let's move on to photo editing and programming. But before that, Trade Coffee, thank you so much for sponsoring this video. I need some coffee right now, so we got we gotta roll this. Trade Coffee arrives right at your door on a regular basis and is personalized to your taste. I took their personalization quiz and I have to say I'm a pretty average coffee drinker, but I'm so excited to try these new flavors. Hello back to you, Trade Coffee. I can already smell it. I enjoy that you can kind of learn about the coffee. Earthy sweet tobacco notes draw from a deep, dark, chocolatey sweetness made extra cozy by its subtle clove spiciness. You know what that smells like? Happiness. Ooh, look at this packaging. Mmm. This is the first roast, the like cool red design bag. Mm. You know what? I kind of taste the hints of vanilla milk chocolate. Just hold on. Have I mentioned it's like 6 p.m.? The first 100 people to use the link in the description below will get 30% off of their first bag of coffee. And there's also free shipping. Okay, all right, awesome. Let's get back to the MacBook photo editing. During the official Apple briefing of this new MacBook, they were showing off some serious photo workflows. Uh, I was connected to an XDR display and also an iPad Pro, you know, all via USB-C. They were very obviously showing off that, hey, having four USB-C Thunderbolt 3 is worth it. They're stitching together a panorama with just an ungodly amount of pixels and it just didn't stutter. It didn't hesitate. I'm mainly in Lightroom and Photoshop and I've been taking more pictures lately. I thoroughly enjoyed using the Leica Q2 recently, but those are 80 megabyte DNG raw files, which are pretty hefty and this really didn't have any issues. So that importing time, that exporting time is probably the most important to me. 
and then also how quickly can we see the previews when applying those filters. So if you can see, it's insanely quick, of course, in that small preview up in the left-hand side. And if you can see, it's not going as fast on the full-size previews, which is fine. You know, these are pretty big files, um, but that's also something that my Dell XPS 13 2-in-1 uh, can be really, really snappy with as well. I think the biggest advantage for photographers with this MacBook is actually something that has been consistent throughout the years, and it's that massive, massive trackpad. No other laptop compares to this trackpad. It is so smooth and easy to use, and it just makes sense in this workflow when you're in Photoshop or Lightroom. If you use a mouse a lot, then hey, that doesn't matter at all, but oh my gosh. That's really the only thing I miss over in Windows laptop land is that trackpad. Since I mentioned that, something I just have to say is I missed a touchscreen on my laptop so much. It's become such a part of my workflow in Lightroom when applying filters over faces or when it comes to Photoshop, really cutting people out of thumbnails, being able to use a pen, being able to use touch to zoom into pictures and just overall functionality. I don't think, no, I know. It is not a gimmick anymore. It works flawlessly. I guess they're concerned if they put a touch display, it might like jeopardize iPad sales or something. I don't know. Put a touch screen in your laptop, Apple. It'll never happen, but I can still scream into this void, right? Mm -hmm. Also, something I didn't mention, the display is great. You know, I can tell that, oh, it's not 4K. I've been using 4K displays a lot recently, but I love the extra vertical space. I really hope 16 by nine displays just die. It's bright, 500 nits pretty color accurate. So yeah, it's time to kick it back to Sarah and Adam from last week to talk about the MacBook Pro 16 for programmers. So we're gonna feature a friend that you've seen once before on this channel, Adam, who we are actually building a software together right now. This has been his machine of choice and not just him, but I see a little theme around the programming community that they just love their MacBooks. The obvious two reasons that I think this upgrade is so big for programmers is one, a physical escape key because, oh my gosh, relying on the touch bar for anything is kind of a mess. So we got that back now that we have the new, really not new keyboard, but it just goes back to that scissor switch design. Um, you get more travel. It's more of an enjoyable experience when on the go programming. Cause you guys, you type a lot, right? Adam, it's time for you to get on camera. Are you ready for your second Sarah Peachy video? I'm always ready. I, I feel like a lot of programmers choose a setup. Well, yeah. And I mean, now that laptops are as powerful as they are, there's no need to have two separate machines. Uh, having said that, 95% of the time, my laptop is in this position, i.e. closed. So I never worried about the keyboard that much. I never worried about the touch bar, although not having any function keys was obviously a huge pain. Uh, the escape key thing was an issue, but most of the time it was in, I think they call it <laughs> clamshell, weird phrase. Then I've got the hyperdrives plugged in, three monitors. It's aggressive and I feel like it barely hangs together. I was really hoping that I'd get a lot more confidence with like having things connected, but I feel like it's everything's still temperamental. It doesn't always wake up that well. Cause he needs sheer power. Four Thunderbolt ports means that he can hook up three displays. He has a hard drive. He has so many things plugged in. I've always preferred to have as much RAM as possible. In terms of workflow, I pretty much use uh, Node.js really for, for everything. I work in Visual Studio Code. There are lots of processes in Visual Studio Code that helps the development ecosystem. There are like test runners that are running as well as the actual application. And it's more of a resource hungry environment when you are iOS developing. They're gonna be yeah. compiling something in Xcode. They wanna see it over here in their simulator yeah. to see what it's gonna look like on an iPhone. Yeah, and I've definitely read that with these 2009 models that uh, is noticeably quicker. So I haven't done much uh, iOS Xcode stuff myself, so I can't really speak to that. But I feel like, uh, you know, Certainly with this application and all the stuff I have running on a day-to-day -day basis on this machine, you know, I dabble in Photoshop and some Premiere Pro and stuff like that. You know, I almost never need to worry about it. I feel like it more than, it more than caters for, for my day-to-day. -day. Apps, stuff I've got running any given day. Visual Studio Code is always open. I should start here actually. Google Chrome is the browser for developers. Takes so much RAM, but it's great. Yeah, if you get plenty of RAM, you just never need to worry about it. Um, I use this mail client actually called Mailplane. 
which I quite enjoy because hmm. I can open many accounts. They all probably do this now. Is that that? Because it looks yes. pretty. Yes. So you can see all my global enterprises are listed. Now, Data Grip is the database client. This is where we can manage the database and write functions, uh, query the data, stuff like that. So the next one is iTerm, which is a terminal. You can use that to uh, interact with stuff uh, in the cloud, create machines, take machines down, basically control any aspect of your cloud infrastructure on the terminal. And then there is Slack and uh, and then I've just got Firefox. So I just sometimes like to switch between Chrome and Firefox just to make sure there's no, or to try and catch weird differences. Sometimes there are weird differences in those browsers, the way they run. Yeah, Photoshop as well, as I say, Premiere Pro, sometimes have that running. If we're checking stuff out that we're gonna put out for the business, I'll kind of take a look over that. I never close these things, right? They just kind of write, run all the time. And I feel like this Mac is pretty good, especially with plenty of RAM. And to wrap things up, you, upgraded already a year and a half after you bought the 2017 MacBook. They really did actually fix a lot of issues that were in the 2016, 2017, and 18 models with the butterfly keyboard, the physical escape key, right. um, cooling issues, they fixed the cooling. So hopefully now this will be a machine that you can hold on to um, for hopefully three plus years. I can officially say that buying a MacBook Pro isn't going to be the worst decision. You can use this machine for the next four to five years. It's going to be powerful. You're not gonna be upset by the little quirks of the keyboard being terrible, um, but you still have to consider that, hey, the touch bar just doesn't work sometimes. Hey, the Thunderbolt 3 USB-C ports are kind of weak steel. Steel. Stale. That's when Southern Sarah comes out. St are you stale? stale? Stale. We'll have to follow up if you're having the same battery issues with this one, but what happened to your previous 2017 MacBook Pro model? They they, they all went wrong. They all got fat batteries. You know, we, we do work them pretty hard and they all got fat batteries and the keyboards all broke. Oh, that's interesting. So I yeah. wonder, cause they made the battery bigger this time around and they they did make it a little bit thicker. So I'm wondering if we'll encounter the same problems. I don't know, we'll have to follow up. Mm. Well, apparently Let's... they leaked gas. Apparently the batteries leaked gas and the gas had nowhere to escape because it's such a tight enclosure. It, uh, it that's what caused the swelling. Leaked gas? Apparently so. I don't that's know. That's what batteries... the Apple geniuses told you? Or... Yes, that's exactly who told us that. Yeah. So do you think it's because you always have them plugged in, running, a lot of monitors plugged in, it's just powering yeah. a lot constantly. So time will tell with the battery things. Um, as you can tell, again, the MacBook Pro is no longer my favorite laptop on the planet, but they have now solved the blatant problems, but you're still paying so much money for what you get. Up to you guys, let me know what you thought of this video. Adam, thank you for being in it. You're welcome. Um, it was a long one, so you should definitely subscribe. Let me know if you like this video. Hit that subscribe button. And until next time, guys, stay peachy. I think that's all they need to do. Okay, bye.